Let me ask you a question. To a bank, is a deposit an asset or a liability? As Nash would say, if you said liability, move to the front of the class. Hello and welcome to the Durham Talents Channel. My name is Jesse Durham. For today's quick take, we're discussing the cost of capital. Now let's begin by defining capital. Capital, simply put, money and possessions. Another is money, property, or stock invested in any business or the enterprise of any corporation or institution. So let's just simply go with the first one, money, capital. Now, once we do recognize that money is simply a means of exchange, meaning I would exchange money for gasoline in the car, groceries in the refrigerator, for a vacation, for an education, business equipment, what have you, and vice versa, those things are sold or exchanged for money. Okay, so money is just the means of exchange. When we refer to money as capital, the question then becomes – Beyond the number associated with that amount, is there a cost to that capital? I don't know how that question strikes you, but again, let me return to one of my initial questions. To a bank, for example, is a deposit, when we deposit money in a commercial bank, does that bank view that deposit as an asset or as a liability? What's your answer? Big pregnant pause right here because I want to give you a moment to think about that. Hit pause if you need to. I would encourage you to hit pause. Don't watch the, the rest of this for a few seconds. Give an answer. Really, give an answer. And now here we're back. To the bank, a deposit is, in fact, a liability. Because you've placed that money with the bank, they have to be able to return it to you. They need to be profitable, of course. So they have to put that money to work. They've probably promised to give you some amount of convenience, interest, etc. Okay. So to the bank, it is a liability. They must put it to work. Capital has a cost to it. Now what they do, what they do with that money can be an asset. Of course, let me give you a scripture and see how this strikes you. There is an old parable that Jesus spoke about in Matthew chapter 25, where three individuals were given amounts of money to do things with it while the owner was gone on a trip. Two out of the three were active, using that money, earning more, investing, working, whatever it was that they were doing. The third dug a hole in the ground, buried it, didn't touch it. Now, here's the question. Of course, the owner came back and said, why, why do I have the same amount being returned to me? What happened? Why isn't it more? Was that Money going to grow in the hole in the ground? Of course not. I mean, it, it, before I get that question out of my mouth, you already know the answer. Well, no, of course it's not going to grow and have little money babies and, and have, have a nice brood of dollars, okay? Uh, of course not. And furthermore, you run some risks, right? Where you put money matters. You could be assuming some risks depending on where you put money. Money in a hole in the ground? Is that very protected? Is that safe or secure? Eh, not so much. you know. And then other things. Is that owner going to be charged taxes? over the course of time on that money and so many different things. So what I'm establishing here is that capital has a cost to it. Is capital worth something? Yes, but there is a cost to it as well. Just like the deposits that we deposit at the bank to the bank, that's a liability. There's a cost going to be associated with using that money. Vice versa. If we go to the bank and we take a, a loan from the bank, we have to pay that bank interest back, don't we? Yes, capital has a cost to it. Now, there are two things I'd like to convey on this quick take because there are two ways of conventional finance. One way is credit. Folks are using debt. Folks are using credit. Okay, You're going to a bank. You are taking a loan. And again, if you're approved after you go through the paperwork on their timeline, provide collateral, all these different things, you also are going to pay interest on that money because there's a cost associated with that capital. And the average American is bleeding out 34 and a half cents of every dollar in interest alone. By becoming your own banker, implementing what's in this Becoming Your Own Banker book by R. Nelson Nash, you can begin to recapture that interest instead of bleeding it out like the average American is. 
there's a cost to capital. Okay, here's the other one. And this is maybe a harder hurdle to jump over. Folks that like paying cash for things say, I don't want to have payments. I don't want to use debt. I don't want to owe anybody. I pay cash for the things that I do. Notice this. To pay cash for the things that you do, you have to forego using that capital, which means you forego the potential to earn interest on your money, giving a cost to your capital. Time has to go by. Perhaps you expose yourself to risk, depending on where you put it. Perhaps you're not accounting for taxation or inflation and lots of other things. I mean, if it's just a hole in the ground or some other equivalent, then you're assuming some risks and you're foregoing some opportunities for sure. How do we know this? Because capital has a cost to it. Not just the amount of money that was in the hole, but the amount of the money but the amount that the money could have been procuring, could have been compounding, could have been growing in interest. Okay? So these two ways of finance, credit and cash, in both those situations, either you're paying interest or you're losing the opportunity to earn interest. Well, becoming your own banker gives a true cost to your capital. When you're actively paying premiums into a properly structured whole life policy with a mutual company that pays dividends, that money is actively for the rest of your whole life accruing uninterrupted compound interest. And you maintain access to it. It provides you with a death benefit. You have control. It's easy to manage. This is a private asset. You can get access to that compounding pool of capital tax-free to so you have liquidity to be able to use it, leverage it even. So you're giving a cost to your capital just by putting it in this ideal financial entity. Now, when you access capital from your policy to implement infinite banking in whatever way that you are, again, there, give a true cost to that capital. If you access money from a policy to go and pay off a debt, finance something, acquire something, invest somewhere. Give a true cost to that capital. Give a true market rate value of interest to that capital. So recapture that that otherwise would have gone to someone else or that you otherwise would have lost if you were just using cash from your cash flows instead of using a private banking system. So just think, if you had $100,000 on your kitchen table, what good is it doing you there on the kitchen table? And I'm not just talking about putting it to use, but I'm talking about what are you doing to account for taxation? What are you doing to account for inflation? That capital has a cost to it. Not only is there $100,000 on the table there, but what could that $100,000 be earning? And again, I'm still not talking about investing at this point. I'm still not talking. I'm talking about banking. That capital has to be warehoused somewhere. The ideal place to bank it, to build it up, to accrue it, to amass it, is in a properly structured whole life policy with a mutual company that pays dividends. Let that be the warehouse for your wealth. Let that be where you amass your capital for all the benefits that you get with properly structured whole life policies. And furthermore, what you do with it in using it the cash value from a policy and being able to leverage that and use that, give that also a true cost to the capital and all that, because all that does is let you grow and compound your private banking system. And in, and in addressing this, this cost of capital in this quick take, let me give you another analogy that came to mind. Jim Rohn talked about teaching a child, not just to have one bike, but getting two bikes. Why two bikes? Well, to be able to have one to ride around and enjoy yourself, but having a second bike to be able to rent out. What an interesting way to think about things. Now, that's a bit more of a, a business venture than, than anything else, but I like the thinking behind it of not just being a consumer, but being a provider as well, providing some value to someone else in the wide marketplace and giving 
some common example that we could understand to think about such a situation in just a neat and a different and a profitable way. It's just a profitable thing. So again, take that $100,000 from the kitchen table that we were talking about, and you pick a certain kind of a boat, and you buy as many boats as you can with that $100,000. Would you take those to the marina and just anchor them there and not use them, or, or dry dock them and not use them? Or wouldn't you rent them out? See, if money is just a means of exchange, meaning we would sell boats for money or buy boats with money, if money is just a means of exchange and we would never take a boat, a bunch of boats, and dry dock them and not use them, then why would we do that with money? Why would we put money in a hole in the ground? We shouldn't. I'm encouraging thought around this whole subject, and this is just one aspect of financial literacy. This is just one aspect of becoming financially independent and autonomous by considering that capital has a cost to it. Furthermore, I would encourage you to check out my free introductory presentation, a more comprehensive investigation of financial independence and autonomy by checking out my free introductory presentation on becoming your own banker, the idea of the infinite banking concept from R. Nelson Nash. It's at my website, durhamtalents.com. This has been a great pleasure for me. I look forward to our next conversation. You can find me at durhamtalents.com. Hope you have a great day. Take care.